tonight, first victim, an elderly man dies after that coronavirus outbreak in a Western Sydney nursing home. The 93-year-old Newmarch House resident, one of three new deaths across our state. Departure block, the Ruby Princess again delayed from leaving our shores as more crew members test positive. Chinese takeover, Virgin Australia could fall into foreign ownership as one state throws the troubled carrier a lifeline. Virus protests, angry scenes in the US at rallies against the life-saving lockdown spurred on by their president. Sydney Harbour drug bust, dramatic arrests as a luxury yacht is hauled in by police, suspected links to organised crime. And cricket's finances hit the six. Savage pay cuts at head office that will also impact the game's big names. Live from our Sydney headquarters, this is 7 News with Michael Usher. Good evening. Four more people are dead from COVID-19, taking the national toll to 69. As feared, the latest victim was a resident of the Newmarch Nursing Home near Penrith, where 19 other residents and 10 staff remain infected. The cluster at Caddens has claimed its first victim. Who was positive for COVID-19 and who was already suffering multiple serious health issues has passed away late this morning. The 93-year-old, a resident of Newmarch House Nursing Home, one of three deaths across the state, along with an 82-year-old passenger of cruise ship Celebrity Eclipse and a woman at Tamworth. The 58-year-old, now the youngest person in the state to die from COVID-19. People whose families today will be obviously very sad. Cases again are down, just 10 more positive to a total of 2,936 across New South Wales. The need to quickly track those exposed to the virus has seen the government ramp up support for its planned COVID app, which would record details of anyone who's been near the user's phone for 15 minutes. The PM tweeting this morning the app will not be mandatory. No one's got access to your data, no one's tracking you, there's no surveillance. So a 1% uptake of the app would be an improvement. Uh, the more we have, uh, the better that would be. The focus of the research world is finding and testing a vaccine and Westmead Hospital has been leading the way here. Today, from the state government, $25 million to fast-track human trials. But experts warn it will take time. Those trials will not start before the end of the year. Cameron Price, 7 News. The state government has admitted the Ruby Princess isn't going anywhere soon as infections on board rise. Families of overseas victims are now lining up to sue the cruise company and if it's found to have been at fault, the state government could be next. The Ruby Princess going nowhere. I think the chance of it leaving tomorrow is remote. The departure date delayed as another nine crew test positive, bringing the total number of people on board with coronavirus to 162. We're yet to get to a point that we can say that the, the crew um, are well enough to travel. American passenger Mindy Birkenholz knows how they feel. She contracted coronavirus from the cruise liner and is now launching legal action. We're not quarantined. We were allowed to roam the ship and enjoy all of the amenities. I guess my life didn't matter. She got off the ship in Sydney with a group of 10 friends before they all flew back to the States. Nine tested positive for COVID-19. They set me on the loose to infect other people. One of the people that I sat next to on the plane ended up getting this and died. It follows another American family suing for $1 million US after passenger Chung Chen died from COVID-19. His family claims the cruise operator chose to place profits over the safety of its passengers. That allegation also under investigation here. The New South Wales Police Homicide Squad can, are working around the clock to gather as much evidence for that investigation as is possible. The outcome could lead to further legal action on home soil, with the state government potentially in the firing line. The action obviously is against uh, the, uh, the owners of that particular line at the moment. Um, I think that indicates what the lawyers are thinking, but let's leave it to uh, the Commission of Inquiry to determine... And Miley Hogan's at Port Kembla, where the Ruby Princess remains tonight. Miley, good evening to you. Looks like the ship could be here for quite some time yet. 
Yeah, good evening, Michael. Authorities have indicated the ship could leave Australia by the end of next week, but as we've seen with the Ruby Princess, that could all change. Almost all of the crew members left on board have now been tested for coronavirus. Those results are due back in the next 48 hours. The aim is to get them well and then build immunity amongst the crew members before that ship can leave Australia to avoid another outbreak at sea. But tonight, Michael, it is still unclear where the Ruby Princess would even go. Molly Hogan at Port Kembla, thank you for that. The Ruby Princess may be staying here for now, but it's a very different story for another cruise liner that's in WA. The Artania has been ordered to leave by Border Force after another person linked to the ship died. The latest victim, a 42-year-old crew member, now Australia's youngest person to succumb to COVID-19. The German vessel has been docked in Fremantle for three weeks. China might try to buy Virgin Australia. A group of Chinese airlines is reportedly in talks with the company, which is on the verge of collapse. Queensland, where the airline is based, has given them a cash injection, but it's well short of what's needed. I've been an aircraft engineer with Virgin Australia for 18 years. Virgin staff on social media. Please give Virgin Australia the support that it deserves. Plead for federal help. Mr Morrison, please give us a hand. Virgin Australia's shares are in a trading halt as the virus lockdown flies it to the verge of financial collapse. Let's face it, no airline in the world can survive COVID-19. Virgin wants a $1.4 billion Commonwealth loan. I think the government should accept that because if they do not do that, they'll have a $1.5 billion bill. 16,000 unemployed people. Today, one government moved. Queensland can't do this on its own. We need a national response. Queensland committing $200 million, but only if the federal government pitches in. Shareholders and bondholders also ask to help, and the resuscitated airline must stay based in Brisbane. Here, the government argues Commonwealth money ought to help the sector, not just one player. As well, unnamed government sources suggest the Treasurer would likely not stand in the way of a foreign buyer. There's a, a bunch of commercial negotiations going on with Virgin. We don't want to prejudice those negotiations. So we'll just wait and see how they go. In Brisbane's Courier Mail this morning, a new possible Virgin buyer. Three Chinese government-owned airlines, apparently in discussions, though yet to make an offer. Very good airlines, very practical, very focused. Tim Lester, 7 News. The drop in foot traffic at our shopping centres is causing a double blow to businesses, with customers staying home and thieves moving in. It comes as vile attacks on our frontline workers increase, causing stress not just for them, but their families too. Ruby Nick's Cafe was already struggling, reliant on foot traffic that barely exists now inside Westfield Miranda and on Thursday night. It's a punch in the guts, that's it. A young female slinks into the cafe wearing a face mask, followed by a friend casually eating KFC. They squat out of view, trying to prise open drawers and cupboards with screwdrivers, then pay dirt, iPads and other goods before slinking out again, tucking their stolen goods beneath their jumpers. Very confident, very brazen. Sarah Johnston and Andrew Shaloub have worked up the family business for 20 years. We're already on our knees, trying our best to support our employees. Absolutely, you can forgive them, but they need to be caught and dealt with first. Police expect they will identify the young females pretty quickly and they describe the targeting of vulnerable small businesses as a low act, but they say there are lower ones. Tyron Maru walked free on bail today. Did you, did you spit or cough on police? No, I didn't. The Tregear forklift operator is accused of doing that when pulled over on a motorcycle at Beverly Hills. He denies it but has pleaded guilty to low-range drink driving and riding an unregistered bike without a helmet on a footpath. Another 25-year-old man has been fined for spitting on Wyong hospital staff. It's just abhorrent to think that people would spit at another person during this time. Like, I, I really just can't get my head around it because it's just so disgusting. Robert Ovadia, 7 News. A New South Wales Labor senator is the latest government figure to be tripped up by the coronavirus lockdown. Senator Deborah O'Neill had paying guests staying in her Central Coast Airbnb earlier this month, despite the stay-at-home rules. Ms O'Neill says the website already has clear messages about guests complying with any social restrictions, adding she would only accept essential workers going forward. Police are investigating that. 
Well, this was the scene in the US state of Minnesota today. Close to a thousand people rallying to liberate their state from the coronavirus lockdown. There were similar protests across the country, spurred on by the president, under pressure to get the country moving in the face of a soaring new death toll. Defiant and demanding the lockdown ends now. Freedom and liberty, we're losing it. Close to a thousand Americans gather outside the house of Minnesota's governor. No masks, no distance, in a united mutiny over restrictions they say are killing their livelihoods. Don't tread on us, we're the taxpayers. Across the country, the same cry. Everybody come back, May 1st. They have support from Washington. In multiple tweets, President Trump called for states to liberate. And if you look at some of the states you just mentioned, it, it's too tough. A day after announcing the states would call the shots on when to reopen. This is just grossly irresponsible. And it is uh, dangerously uh, bombastic because it inspires people to do dangerous things. These are people expressing their views. I, I see where they are and I see the way they're working. They seem to be very responsible people to me. Today's protest came as the nation recorded yet another record death toll. More than four and a half thousand lives lost in just 24 hours. That's almost double the previous peak. But Donald Trump claims a vocal governor is ungrateful for federal assistance. But I'm saying thank you for doing your job. Telling Andrew Cuomo to spend more time doing and less time complaining. If he's sitting home watching TV, maybe he should get up and go to work, right? In New York, Ashley Mullaney, 7 News. Testing will begin in just days on a possible vaccine for coronavirus in Britain. But it won't come quick enough to save tens of thousands of lives with more grim warnings for the UK on track now to eclipse its European neighbours in this COVID crisis. In Manchester, another of Britain's pop-up hospitals with 750 beds. Every patient who comes here will have had a diagnosis of COVID-19. Across the UK, the crisis is escalating. Nurses and doctors have been told protective equipment has run out. With the nation in lockdown, the economy is facing its biggest hit in centuries and now the starkest of warnings. After this wave, which could kill, you know, we could see 40,000 deaths by the time it's over. Meaning Britain's death toll could quadruple in weeks and the virus could hit in up to six waves over the next 12 months. In Austria, politicians pointed to data describing the current UK death toll as frightening. Britain's biggest hope, like for so many other countries, is a vaccine. Researchers at Oxford University are hoping to begin tests on volunteers as early as next week, but warn it may not work and wouldn't be ready until September at the earliest. Lives have changed everywhere, including for the royals and former royals, delivering messages, connecting with charities and sharing stories of the lockdown. The Cambridges have been homeschooling. Yeah, homeschooling is fun. <laughs> um, I don't tell the children we've actually kept it going through the holidays. I feel very mean. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's just having that bit of bit of structure actually, and um, it's great. And William says they're doing everything they can to protect his grandparents, the Queen and Prince Philip. In London, Hugh Whitfeld, Seven News. Cricket Australia has become the latest sport to be financially hit by this global crisis. It's been revealed the organisation has lost tens of millions of dollars in stock market investments, resulting in some savage pay cuts. Coach Justin Langer, now a part-time employee. Australia's most popular summer sport is feeling the heat of the pandemic. There's probably a lot of people in cricket that want a lot of questions answered. Cricket's got a cash crisis, reserves of just $26 million, down from $198 million four years ago. Coronavirus hitting the sport's $90 million stock portfolio for six. Some estimates have it off at least $15 million. Cricket Australia is forecasting its income to drop by half in the next financial year. A big surprise to hear that it's in this situation at the moment in Cricket Australia, particularly the administration, have got some uh, answer, questions to answer. Here at Cricket Australia, the majority of staff have been stood down until at least June 30. Some concern they've taken an 80% pay cut, the executive team 20%, and they found out through the public announcement first. Even our national coaches face the brunt of the cuts. Justin Langer told last night he's now a part-time employee. Even though he might be part-time, there's no way that he'll be 
backing off his workload. With borders closed and spectators unlikely, Cricket Australia will be desperate to devise a way to host October's T20 World Cup and its biggest cash cow, the summer tour by India. Cancellation would cost the game between $100 and $300 million. Tom Brown, 7 News. OK, let's check the forecast now with Angie Asimus. Angie, good evening. A spectacular start to the weekend. Absolutely, Michael. Just beautiful. Again, we were treated to above average temperatures. The top in the CBD was a very pleasant 24.7 degrees, just a fraction warmer at Penrith with 25 degrees. Generally, though, eastern centres were warmer than those in the west. When you look at the statewide picture, Coffs Harbour reached 24 degrees, just inland Canamble reached 22. Now, we are expecting a slight change to coastal spots tomorrow with some showers picking up. Falls will generally be very light, close to 5 or 10 millimetres. Right now though, it is still fine and warm, sitting on 20 degrees at Manly, 19 at Bankstown. In fact, from there, we won't see a huge drop in temperature tonight. Most coastal minimums staying around 16 degrees, 12 for Liverpool. Sunday weather coming up very soon, Michael. Thank you, Angie. There were dramatic scenes on the harbour today in a major operation to stop organised crime. Up next, what police found on a luxury yacht. Plus, never walk alone, a heartwarming message from the world's favourite fundraiser. How old Anzac Day traditions will continue in this new world? We'll give you those details. Together at home, the all-star lineup lending their voices to celebrate frontline staff. And soon in sport, the call grows louder for an October Origin Series in Rugby League. Dramatic pictures on the harbour today as a luxury yacht was towed into Balmain in a major police operation. Officers in full protective suits greeted the crew, suspects in an organised crime investigation. Authorities pounce on a non-essential visitor floating off our coast. The yacht named the Lafayette, towed by a police boat into Balmain Marine Area Command. It was intercepted south of Newcastle this morning, the target of an organised crime drug investigation by the Border Force, New South Wales and Federal Police. On board, the two alleged drug smugglers with what's believed to be a significant quantity of illicit substances. They were cuffed and thoroughly cleaned before being taken away in paddy wagons to Surrey Hills Police Station. Police have been watching the yacht's movements for some time and say its journey began a long way from Sydney, which is why health and hazmat officials are here to decontaminate the accused men to mitigate any potential risk of COVID-19 transmission. Police haven't said exactly where the yacht had come from or what drugs were hidden on board, but it's clear officers had been watching it for some time. Tom Saker, 7 News. The Rolling Stones will join Paul McCartney, Elton John and a cast of incredible talent for a global fundraising concert done from their homes. One World Together at Home will celebrate and support frontline workers raising money to equip and help them through the coronavirus crisis. It is a love letter to our doctors, a love letter to our nurses and other healthcare professionals who are risking their own lives for the sake of ours. And you can see the event from your home here on 7 straight after weekend sunrise tomorrow. NASA is planning its first manned mission from American soil in a decade. Two US astronauts will board a SpaceX rocket next month headed for the International Space Station. Now the last time American astronauts lifted off from Florida was in 2011 before the space shuttle program was retired. He is the world's favourite new fundraiser and Captain Tom Moore's walk for frontline health workers has reached an amazing new high. The 99-year-old's now surpassed £21 million. Pounds. It's more than $40 million. He's a one-man fundraising machine and God knows what the final total will be, but good on him, I hope he keeps going. The war veteran is inspiring millions of people from his garden. We've heard calls for a knighthood, now he's even recorded a song. is the best. His aim of a hundred laps is already complete but much to Prince William's delight the captain says he will keep going until the donations stop. As we prepare to honour our own veterans next weekend it's clear Anzac Day commemorations will be very different this year. With dawn services cancelled across the country preparations are underway to make sure our diggers are not forgotten.
Next Saturday, 97-year-old New Guinea veteran Les Hall in his old pilot's uniform will listen to the last post in his driveway. Because I'm proud of it. Proud to be an Australian Air Force man. Middle East veteran Jack Hare, too, will honour lost mates at dawn in candlelight. It's one of my proudest moments. It feels that good to be able to stand here and think of your mates. Your mates are most important. Hundreds of thousands will commemorate at home like these two, after Justin Wilbur floated the idea on Facebook and it went viral. Demonstrate those Anzac values of mateship and integrity, ingenuity. Coming together separately, being different, but all acknowledging the Anzacs. Ian Arrell has played at local dawn services for 66 years. Next Saturday, he'll play at home alone at dawn. This is going to add to people's spirits and their emotions and their well-being. I just love to be an Australian. Nick McCallum, 7 News. Our miners are doing vital work to keep New South Wales powered through this pandemic. Next, how the industry is adjusting in these trying times. Great exodus, the impact of Australia's population decline as visa holders head home. Later, road to nowhere, could we be in for rego refunds while we're in lockdown? And all dressed up with nowhere to go. Fashions on the field becomes an isolation sensation. That's next. A second person's now been charged over an illegal drug smuggling ring operating in Nowra Jail. The 32-year-old woman was arrested yesterday. The dog squad searched her Greenacre home, seizing cash, drugs and mobile phones. Police will allege she paid a corrections officer to smuggle phones and drugs inside the prison. The officer was charged earlier this week. There's no doubt workers in the mining industry are essential, helping to support the economy and keeping our lights on. Often out of sight and out of mind, a new campaign is being launched to highlight how they're coping with the coronavirus. Already isolated, now socially distant too. Temperature checks on arrival, meetings carefully spaced out. Mining, like every industry, is not immune to the coronavirus crisis. It's definitely uh, different and a challenge, but really grateful to be able to still work. Ali Standen is working from home as community relations manager for a copper and gold mine in Parks. I'm definitely someone that really enjoys working with people, so I'm definitely missing seeing them every single day. Many miners remain on site, working to meet strong demand for the state's three key commodities, gold, copper and coal. It's very important that we continue operations to keep feeding coal into those power stations so we can keep the lights on in New South Wales. Critical work highlighted in a new ad campaign. We're taking measures to fight the coronavirus. Another danger in an already hazardous environment. We're doing everything possible to protect our workmates and our families. If we have an outbreak and shut down one of our mines, it's, that's their jobs that are, that are gone. The state's 40,000 miners unaffected by cuts. Our mining workforce has really stepped up in implementing these measures across our mining operations. Keeping miners on the job isn't just important for getting Australia's economy through the crisis, it will be critical to the recovery afterwards as well. A lot of credit has to go to the way they're operating mines uh, in this current environment, ensuring their workplace remains safe. Alex Hart, 7 News. A new expert panel led by the state's chief scientist and engineer will help ensure Sydney's drinking water supply is protected from harmful mining contaminants. The panel's been established following a large-scale review which aims to improve transparency around applications to mine in the catchment. There's more bad news for the economy tonight with COVID-19 causing the biggest population drop in Australia's history. As thousands of temporary residents leave the country on government orders, the knock-on effect will be devastating. 
Australia is a country built on immigration, but the pandemic is set to cause the biggest decline in our population in history. Now the Prime Minister is saying, not where the bloody hell are you, but to go home. Many suburbs in some of our biggest cities are especially reliant on the skills of migrants. Just here alone in our city, about 140,000 of our residents are migrants. But many international students and workers on temporary visas are now being told to leave the country. 310,000 people have already left since January. It's almost two years worth of population growth to lose in three months and that's a huge uh, drop. It's expected another 300,000 could all also go home by the end of the year. There are also fears it will hurt the property, retail and hospitality sectors, as well as education and tourism, making a recession inevitable. The size and scale of that recession is really the question now. Some experts believe the government is making a mistake blocking temporary workers from the JobKeeper allowance. They believe the move could further hamper our economic recovery. We paid back the big debt after World War II by having a very, very large baby boom and a very large post-war migration program. I don't think we'll be doing that this time. The big question, how to repay the new debt. Christy Mayer, 7 News. Bob Hawke's widow, Blanche Del Puget, has revealed that she's battling breast cancer. The 76-year-old confirmed the diagnosis in a statement to the Sunday Telegraph, urging all women to get checked. She's been treated at the Kinghorn Cancer Centre here in Sydney. It comes as the writer prepares to face her stepdaughter in a battle over the division of the former Prime Minister's estate. Well, not even a pandemic can stop the glamour of autumn racing carnivals with fashions on the field going virtual for the first time in history. Dressmakers and milliners barely hanging on by a thread, saying it will keep their industry alive through the crisis. She's certainly not trackside, but this fashionista wasn't going to let a good race day outfit go to waste. On the left hand side you've got the rubbish bins, on the right hand side you've got the laundry and uh, in the middle there is a beautiful lady twirling around. She's one of hundreds taking part in fashions or the field competitions online. Many spend thousands of dollars on their race day attire hoping to stand out from the crowd. They source their fabrics whether from overseas or, or Australia, then they get their dressmakers to make their outfits, the milliners to. Tens of thousands of people have been tuning in to the weekly contests. The girls who have entered the last three rounds really brought their aid game. It's brought women together from all over Australia and it gave them a chance to wear their racewear looks during isolation. Men too. And the trends? A lot of sustainable fashion, so a lot of recycling and rewear through uh, uh, people looking through their closet. Because who said social distancing on the weekend couldn't be stylish? Jessica Ridley, 7 News. The state's budding artists are being forced to get even more creative than usual. Next, the virtual gallery tour showcasing our best new talent. Plus, home sweet home, why shipping containers are being transformed into housing pods. Woolworths lifts some of its panic buying limits. And a grey change tomorrow as a few showers skim the coast. Details soon. This is like nothing we have ever faced. We are going to be tested, but we all need to play our part. Stay calm. Don't panic. Be patient. Look out for each other. And most importantly, listen to the experts. Stay inside. Wash your hands. Practice social distancing. Don't impact my ability to save a life. It might be yours that I'm trying to save. Stay at home. And every day, we will come to work for you. Please help us. Let's flatten that curve. Families who've lost everything in the bushfires will be able to sleep a little easier next week with 50 housing pods rolling out to devastated communities. The shipping containers kitted out with a kitchen and laundry can house up to four people. They'll be taken to properties on the mid-north coast and south coast for residents who've been homeless now for months. After weeks of panic buying, Woolies has lifted some of its restrictions on popular products. With stock levels starting to get back to normal, the supermarket has removed limits on canned vegetables, including tomatoes, as well as canned beans and most baby products. Restrictions still apply to hand sanitizer, pasta and toilet paper. 
The COVID-19 health crisis has been tough on the arts sector and for some of our brightest young artists it means missing out on a chance to show their work in public. But a new program has come to the rescue, pushing gallery space into cyberspace for our best new talent. It should look like this. But not this year. With galleries closed, our state's best new artists are still getting their chance to shine. Last year's top HSC pieces now available to everyone via a virtual tour. There are 58 works um, from kids all across New South Wales. Student Thomas Ramos had four of his pieces selected. The artworks that I created were basically um, showcasing how there's other sides to athletes. Highlighting the work of LeBron James, Colin Kaepernick, Derek Rose and Kathy Freeman outside of sport. And for the budding basketballer, the chance that one of the stars might see his work would be humbling. Oh, well, it would be great, especially like, you know, any of the basketball players since I look up to them. But translating artwork from the real world to the virtual can be tricky. We have tried wherever possible to capture those three-dimensional works from all angles in a, in a way that kind of simulates how you would actually engage with them in the gallery space. And the art world will be taking notes. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. If they end up with a digital version of the Archibald, uh, I'll be delighted to see it. Leonie Ryan, 7 News. Refunds for Rego. The petition to slash that bill as thousands of cars sit idle. What it could save you and what our treasurer had to say. Don't miss that story soon here on 7 News. This is a bit of fun. It's a trend online right now, keeping us all a bit amused at home, posting throwback photos with the hashtag MeAt20. Well, Hugh Grant's been an early contributor. There he is on the left there with this photo. There's Nigella Lawson posting a shot of herself 20 years young. Late this afternoon, this popped up from our own Premier, Gladys Berejiklian, who's admitted it's a bit embarrassing, but she's happy to play along. It's a great photo. So in that spirit, well, there's me. That's right about 20 years ago, studying journalism. Uh, there's Angie Asimus. She was at Uni 2 here in Sydney at that age. Not that she looks any different at all right now. And there's Jimmy Wilson. Oh. 20 years old, doing one of his first interviews as a cub reporter. There you go, Jimmy. Who was the scoop? Who are you talking to? That was Brad Freddie Fittler's NRL debut for Penrith in the late 80s, and that was me with a buffon hairstyle. Um, I haven't changed. Do you reckon I've changed a bit? Angie, Angie certainly hasn't changed. Angie hasn't. You and I. We have changed a bit, haven't we? Feels right. like yesterday, Michael. Does indeed. <laughs> uh, OK, Jim, sport. Former Wallaby being shopped around by the NRL. Yeah, they are. He is, Michael. Coming up, Quake Cooper has been linked to a number of Sydney clubs. So who wants him? We're at the very latest next. Plus, one of the game's big stars adds his weight to Origin Oktoberfest and possibly in front of crowds. And a perfect Saturday afternoon at Royal Randwick as champion jockey Huey Bowman tastes more Group 1 success. Welcome back, everyone. Blues coach Brad Fittler has launched a scathing attack on the Queensland Premier this afternoon over her initial staunch opposition to Origin Games proceeding this year. Now, Fittler told Triple M Radio Anastasia Palaszczuk lacked backbone and then said on ABC Grandstand it could cost her with voters. I'm not sure if Anastasia is a rugby league fan, but uh, she's backtracked since then, and that's understandable. I mean, given the popularity of the game up there, especially towards the Maroons, we're given it no chance at all. Is I think it was seen as uh, political suicide. The Queensland Premier says she's open to Origin Games now at the end of the year. Well, ARL Commission Chairman Peter Volandis is closing in on a deal with the Games broadcast partners and the NRL's hopes of restarting the competition on May 28 is gathering momentum. There'll be further talks next week, but it's understood an in-principle agreement has been reached. Now, the push for Origin to be held back until after the grand final is also gaining support Titan star Jai Arrow says the lure of possibly playing the three-game Origin series in front of crowds in October is a big attraction. Hopefully by then there is crowds and, and the fans and you know, the fans are back watching us because playing a game in Origin without fans would, would just wouldn't feel right. It's likely Origin would start in October and push into November under an option being considered. And Seven News understands the West Tigers are not interested in signing former Wallaby Quade Cooper. Despite reports his manager had spoken to the Tigers, there are question marks around Cooper's defensive capabilities if he switches codes. The Bulldogs have also ruled out luring Cooper to Belmore. 
Sydney Swans Chief Tom Harley is standing firm. Their football academy must stay alive. That's despite the potential cuts the AFL could look at during the current crisis. And Harley hopes the Queensland and New South Wales teams aren't left in the cold. I'm really strong and obviously advocating on behalf of the Swans, but more broadly the development of the game north of the Murray. Um, the academies are extremely important. Um, there are opportunities now for the AFL to really affirm their position as a truly national game. The AFL is expected to make a call in the next fortnight on a date for its restart. It promised so much and it delivered. A classic finish to the Schweppes all-age stakes at Ramwick this afternoon. Pirata was hoping for the fairy tale ending but was upstaged in a thriller while jockey Hugh Bowman had more Group 1 success in the Champagne Stakes. The backdrop was spectacular. A beautiful Saturday afternoon at Ramwick and a red-hot field in the all-age stakes. Pirata was hoping to go out a winner and it took a mighty run by Tefane to spoil the farewell party. Pirata, he's looking to go out a winner. Tefane's trying to spoil his party. It's Pirata in front from Tefane. Oh, close! The photo was called for and the Kiwi mayor just got the money. Earlier, Boom Colt King's Legacy gave Peter and Paul Snowden their fourth Moe and Shandon champagne stakes, champion jockey Hugh Bowman's third victory in the Group 1 race. Goes now to Glenn Fettig, they brush, but King's Legacy puts the head in front and Edge is clear, he's the Group 1 King. He's an exceptional Colt and I've been informed that Coolmore have bought into him, so... You know, he's got an impeccable pedigree, so you can see exactly why, and he's just frank that he's one of the best colts in the country. At Caulfield, the feature was the showdown over 1,200 metres, and success for trainer Matt Kamani and jockey Fred Kersley on Quay Quay. Well, rowing's inventive way of running their national regatta has united Aussies in lockdown and put some record-breaking champions in the spotlight. They include, wait for this, 94-year-old Vince Holm, a classic character and a real-life rowing machine. Whether you're in Australia's World Championship silver medal winning eight or just shy of your 95th birthday, age is no barrier to smashing world records on a rowing machine. I started rowing on the 9th of October 2012. Georgie Rowe's half marathon record happened on her first attempt at 21 k's. But I also didn't do it in a way that was actually killing myself. Like I probably could have gone a little bit harder. Vince Holm does 10,000 metres a day. He'll reach 17 million soon. Because I keep getting bribed by chocolate and my favourite food is chocolate. Not the only secret to five world records. Because I've been married for over 70 years and that sure makes you good at endurance rowing. It's made Beryl pretty good at it too. We've always done everything together for 70 years. My aim is to get a world record when I turn 90 at the end of this year. As an aged care nurse on the cusp of an Olympic taboo, Georgie's admiration's twofold. They're just so stoic, you know, they're real stubborn, they're real tough. And just to hear somebody doing that, like I actually get more inspiration out of hearing stories like that than I do with people like Usain Bolt and Kathy Freeman. Just see how they feel when they get to our age. The indoor interstate regatta ends 5pm Monday. Aussies have already clocked enough Ks to circumnavigate the continent nearly five times. Queensland are runaway winners, but they have Beryl and Vince. Just sit down, shut up and row. Matt Carmichael, 7 News. Love it. Vincent Beryl. It's a story which essentially sums up global sports so far in 2020. The Professional Darts Corporation started its Play From Home Tour this morning with over 120 of the world's best players taking part via video conference. But there's a hitch here for two-time world champion Gary Anderson who was forced to withdraw from the competition because his home internet is too slow. Many of the top competitors have said they'll donate any prize money they win to charity. So Wi-Fi became Wo-Fi, and I can also report that the world number one also had to pull out because he's got a two-and-a-half-year-old at home, Michael, and also he's got three dogs. <laughs> so he couldn't do it from home. <laughs> it's understandable. <laughs> exactly. It's a dangerous sport to try at home. Hagger was Vincent Barrow. No, they're the best. Yeah. I love his advice, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Just shut up and do it. Exactly. There you go. All right, well, shut up now. Thank you. <laughs> there are... <laughs> you said it. <laughs> There are new calls for the state government to offer refunds or rebates on car registration as more people stay at home during the coronavirus lockdown. The idea is gaining traction online, but some argue that the state cannot afford it. 
It's hard to find space in Dwayne Dempster's garage. After years of saving, it holds two cars, two motorbikes and his scooter. Motorcycling is my passion. It comes at a cost, particularly for registration and compulsory insurance. It's roughly 6000 a year. But staying at home means he's paying for things he can't use. It's a bit, a bit annoying, I suppose. Um, it's a sunk cost because you've got to pay for it up front, but then you can't use it. Now a new petition is calling for the state government to slash the costs as cars sit idle. People are telling us they need every single dollar they can get at the moment. Western Australia has already frozen car registration and the idea appears popular. More than 3,500 people nationwide have signed the petition in support, 35% from New South Wales, where annual rego is at least $280 and CTP insurance starts at just under $500. Yeah, it'd be good because, um, you know, you pay for the roads and you're not, uh, you're not using them. Anything that saves us money is a good thing. It could be a full rebate, it could be a partial rebate, it could be a credit against next year's rego and insurance. The state's treasurer, Dominic Perrottet, has told Seven News while the government will look at new ways to help residents, it's already spent more than $10 billion during the coronavirus pandemic. We completely understand that, but we think there's a missing piece in the puzzle now, and the next thing they need to address is government bills. Amber Laidler, Seven News. Coming up, Angie Asimus has the forecast. Angie, hello again. There's a change on the way for the rest of the weekend. Michael, a lot more cloud cover about tomorrow with some coastal showers likely as well. Your comprehensive Sunday outlook is next. Tonight, Seven News headlines. A virus outbreak in a Western Sydney nursing home has claimed a first victim. The stricken Ruby Princess won't leave tomorrow as planned with nine new confirmed cases overnight. Extraordinary scenes across the US, thousands protest shoulder to shoulder, demanding an end to crippling lockdowns. And the suspected drug boats being intercepted and dragged into Sydney Harbour, two crew on board arrested. Now, Angie Asimus is back with the forecast. Angie, after a great day, some great skies in store for our Sunday. Yeah, that's right, Michael. A bit of a change after this recent run of sunshine and very warm temperatures. We ended up with another beautiful top today of 24.7 degrees, and that followed an overnight low of 13.8. Most centres around Sydney reached the mid-20s. Very little separated the east from west today. Manly hit 25 degrees, 23 at the airport. Parramatta made it to 24. Katoomba, a little bit cooler, reaching 19. From the satellite, winds are still tending southwesterly at the moment. Not a great deal of cloud cover over New South Wales. And tomorrow, high pressure does continue to be the dominant feature on the map once again, which means very little change. Just some coastal showers fuelled by a trough here and some onshore winds. Now, tomorrow's capitals, Brisbane, will see a possible shower top of 27 degrees. Canberra staying fine, although cool, just 17 forecast top. Melbourne, partly cloudy, 18. Hobart, a light shower, 16. Late showers developing in Adelaide, while Perth, is expecting early showers, 23 degrees. Across the state, temperatures will be a little bit cooler tomorrow. Newcastle aiming for a top of 21, 18 degrees at Wagga Wagga, and it will be a gusty 7 degrees at Threadbow, so getting very cool there. We will see a change tomorrow around Sydney, though, with a lot more cloud cover. The chance of a morning fog just in the outer west and some coastal showers during the morning and afternoon. Tops ranging from the high teens to low 20s as we move further inland. It will be chilly in the mountains, though, 50 15 is the forecast top at Katoomba. On the water, east to south easterly winds running at 10 to 15 knots, then tending east to north easterly at 10 knots during the afternoon and evening. And that is on a sizeable two and a half metre swell. For the city now, a mild low of 15 degrees tonight, heading for a top of 20, so a fair bit cooler than what we have been seeing throughout this week. It will be a grey day overall with a few passing showers, probably nothing more than 5 to 10 millimetres, though, as we look to the week ahead, those showers will be short-lived. It is going to be overcast on Monday. Temperatures pretty, pretty close to average. Clear skies returning from about Tuesday. And then we have some lovely temperatures to look forward to in the mid to high 20s, becoming quite warm by Friday, 20. 27 expected in the city, 29 in our west. But first, just a couple of showers on the way tomorrow, Michael. All right, Angie, thank you for thank that. Thank you. That is 7 News for this Saturday. We'll have updates for you throughout the evening and the latest is straight after this bulletin. I'm Michael Usher from all of us here. Thank you so much for your company. Have a great Saturday night.